I don't know about you, but I just kind of felt like God was like in an in a extra measure of grace in our worship this morning. Would you join me in thanking our worship team and our band for what they do for us every single week? I love that new song. I love that. <clears throat> so good, I almost thought I had rhythm there for a second. <clears throat> when I was a kid growing up in Houston, Texas, a, a young guy, I was obsessed. I, I was consumed. You could even say I idolized Batman. Now, how many Batman fans do we have in the room? I know some people are Superman fans, and you can be wrong, but Batman, Batman was where it is at. And I'm not talking about Batman in the comic books. I'm not talking about Batman in the movie theater. I'm talking about TV Batman. I'm talking about Adam West Batman. How many Adam West Batman fans do we have in the house? He was the guy, dashing and debonair, millionaire Bruce Wayne. You know today he would be billionaire Bruce Wayne, but back in the 70s and the 60s when it was on the air, he was millionaire Bruce Wayne. He was a phone call away on the bat line or a bat signal in the night sky away from going to help out Commissioner Gordon and Chief O'Hara as they foiled the evil plans of the dastardly villains of Gotham City. You, you know the guy that I'm talking about, Batman. Well, now I told you that to tell you this. I've got two brothers, Pat and Gil, they're twins. Gil is the older by 13 minutes, two and a half years younger than I am. And both of them are great guys. I mean, great, great men, great guys, great husbands, dads, everything. Well, they're both really, really funny. Gil has more of a dry sense of humor, whereas my brother Pat has more of a kind of slapstick, laugh out loud sense of humor and, and has always been that guy. But when we were kids, Pat, more than any other person on the planet knew how to push my buttons, how to get under my skin. He just knew exactly what to say and what to do. How many of you have a younger sibling like that? You know what I'm talking about. How many of you are that younger sibling? <laughs> Y'all are terrible. Ter anyway, well, Pat knew this at an early age. And this happened when I was probably six years old, which means Pat might have been four maybe four years old. We're driving through the streets of Houston. My mom's driving. We're in the back seat of the car, just hanging out, looking out the window, not even really talking about anything. And Pat knew how just completely eat up with Batman I was. And at four years old, the following happened. We're driving down the street, and Pat says out of nowhere, apropos of nothing, there's Batman. Well, I whipped around. Where's Batman? I started craning my neck, looking out the window. Where, where's Batman? And Pat never even skipped a beat. Just said, matter of factly, oh, you missed him. <laughs> Four years old. That's impressive. My mom still loves to tell that story about me. She's kind of mean spirited, but it is, it's a funny story. But whether we're children or grown ups or undecided in between, isn't it true that we have to be really, really, really careful about whom we idolize, about what we idolize? Who do we put up on a pedestal and obsess over? It's part of just being a human being that we tend to, we tend to obsess, we tend to respect or maybe even revere, we tend to focus or maybe even fixate on certain people, certain things, certain ideas, and if we idolize the wrong people or the wrong things, we can begin to lose touch with reality. We can begin to lose touch with ourselves. Now, if you would have asked me in a sane moment, is Batman real? At six years old, I probably would have said no. But in the moment, because I was so obsessed with Batman, because I so idolized Batman, when my brother Pat set me up like that, I didn't know fact from fiction, reality from fantasy for just a split second. This is a part of who we are as human beings. And here's the thing about idols. Whatever we idolize is by definition telling us idol lies. Idols always lie. 
Idols, by their very definition, are deceitful. They always overpromise and under deliver. It is the same dynamic that we see at play in addictions. Any addiction is ultimately an issue of idolatry because an addiction, whether it's the next drink or the next hit or the next purchase or whatever our addiction might be, whatever our idol might be, it is that thing that we have allowed, it's that thing of ours, it's our possession that we have traded places with God's position where we trade and God's rightful place on the throne of our lives is usurped by something or by someone. And instead of God being on the throne, we instead put a thing or a person or an idea on that throne. This is one of the things that the Bible talks about from cover to cover. The very first of the Ten Commandments, God says, you will have no other gods before me. It is a commandment, but never forget even God's commands are expressions of his love. Why would God say, you will have no other gods before me? If I told Julie, my wife, Julie, you will love me, that's not going to go well. But God says, you'll have no other gods before me because he knows that any God we place on the throne of our lives will ultimately disappoint us, will ultimately betray us, will ultimately frustrate us and create deep, deep problems in our lives. Now that's in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, in the book of Colossians, the Bible says it puts a really, really fine point on this idea of idolatry and the lies that our idols tell to us. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. He's writing under the inspiration, under the authority of the Holy Spirit of God. But look at what he says here. He goes, now, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. That's that's real. That's true. Think about the things of heaven and not the things of earth. In verse 5, he goes on to say, now, Put to death the sinful earthly things that are lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, with impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. A greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things... Does that maybe sound a little extreme? Does it feel to you like maybe the Bible is just a little bit overstating its case? I think I understand why it may come across that way initially, but when you understand what an idol is, you understand why the Bible says this. Here's just a working definition of an idol, whatever the idol might be. An idol is any alternative to God. Any alternative to God can be an idol. It can be money, it can be things, it could be a person. You you could make an idol of your spouse. You could make you could make an idol (laughs) you you could make an idol of your children. Think about that for a second. If the reason you get up in the morning, the reason you work, the reason you pray, the reason you live, the reason you plan and whatever is so that your children will grow up to be healthy, happy adults then you've made an idol of your children's happiness. And besides being a bad idea for you, think about the weight that we're asking our kids to carry, even subconsciously, if that's the center of our universe. An idol is any alternative to God. And as we've already established, all idols lie. All idols lie all the time to everyone, and everyone includes you. Everyone includes me. I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them like you mean it. Everybody means you. Okay, I love you too much to lie to you. That was terrible. Now, this is Time Change Sunday. Y'all all slept in. You got, a, you, know, you got an extra hour ahead of the people who are here at 9.15, so you've been properly caffeinated now for a couple of hours. 
So I want you to say it like you really mean it and like you're happy to be. What a beautiful morning we have right now. So I want you to turn back to your neighbor again and tell them like you mean it. Everybody means you. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. There you go. Now, when we say that idols lie, idols always overpromise and under deliver, but there is there are some specific lies that idols will tell us, particularly in the area of finances. Here's the thing that's funny, I think. <clears throat> I've noticed this in my own life. I, I won't project onto you, but in my life, I can relatively freely admit most temptations. You know, if I I remember when I was a little kid, I stole a package of M&Ms from the Circle K next door to the church. How ironic. I, I certainly can fall subject to anger in an unhealthy way. I, I, can, I can lust. I, I can do all those things. I did one time about 25 years ago. It doesn't. So I, I fall prey to the same things that you do. But very, very rarely will anyone say, you know what, greed's a problem for me. Very rarely does somebody go, you know what, I'm just materialistic. I just have to stay on top of it. That's how insidious, that's how deceitful the idol of money and finances can be. So I want to mention to you five idol lies that finances will tell to us or materialism will tell to us. These financial idol lies, number one, is the idle lie of sovereignty. Money can convince us that we are sovereign over our circumstances. Or we can think, you know what, if I could just make enough, then I would have enough to insulate me against problems or stress or trauma. And the truth is, there is no amount of money in the world that can guarantee your sovereignty over circumstances or my sovereignty over circumstances. Sovereignty belongs to God alone. That's reality. The Bible says that there will come a day when every tongue confess and every knee will bow that Jesus is Lord. That's, that's real, that's true. So the sovereignty of God is actually the first step toward mental health. When I acknowledge he is God and I am not, I'm taking the first step away from anxiety, the first step away from stress, the first step away from depression. I'm stepping into the reality of the sovereignty of God. I'm not sovereign. You're not sovereign. Now, we like to be, don't we? I, I'm going to tell you, I like my way. Does anybody else like your way? I do. I mean, and, and it started early in my life. That, that's, that's true. Anybody who doubts the depravity of humanity has never spent any time with a two-year-old. What's the first abstract idea that any child grasps? Mine. And it's not, it's not, some of you said it, you said mine. No, 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 no. It's mine. Mine. It, it's mine. It's mine, not yours because I am sovereign. That's what two-year-olds think. Two-year-olds, toddlers think they're sovereign. Mature people understand they're not the center of the universe. Mature people don't date people who think they're the center of the universe. Mature people help their spouses learn they're not the center of the universe. Parents help children learn they're not the center of the universe. But money can make us think a little bit more, and I'll be there. Just a little bit more, and I'll be sovereign. The second financial idol lie flows out of the first. Sovereignty gives birth to sufficiency. Sufficiency. We think, I'm self-sufficient. I am a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. And the reality is, no one is self-made. You're not, I'm not None of God's children are self-made. Now, somebody's thinking to themselves right now, whoa, 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 Mac, I've worked hard. I've worked hard. I have planned. I have strategized. I've built a company. I've built a business. And that's great. 
But the Bible says, do not forget the Lord your God who gives you the ability to acquire wealth. You, you may have done well. You may have hit great success financially, materially. But where did you get the ability to do that? Where did you get the mind? Where did you get the body? Where did you get the health? Who sustains your breath? God. You're not sufficient. I'm not sufficient. We need help to survive. The third of the financial idolize. Security, security, security. And I just, want, I just want to have enough to where I don't have to worry anymore. We live in financially uncertain times, don't we? Are we in a recession? Is there a recession coming? Is it ever going to end? What? Well, it depends on what TV station you listen to. And so we think, yeah, if I, you know what? I don't care what MSNBC or Fox or anybody else says. If I just make enough, I can be secure and it's not going to matter. That'll insulate me against any financial calamity, any economic collapse, any global pandemic, any this, any that, any tragedy, any trauma. And again, there is no amount of money that can insulate you against any of those things. Now, money can help. It's a good idea to have health insurance. That's called being a responsible adult. But there's no such thing as complete security against those things. That, that's a lie that materialism tells us. The fourth one, now we don't say this one out loud, but it's real. Status. Status. You know, if I could live in that neighborhood, or if I could drive that car, or you know what, if I could wear that watch or shop at that jewelry store, it doesn't matter to me, but I know in some people's eyes it would give me a certain status. The reality is you're a child of the living God. You are already an heir to the throne of God in Jesus' name. So your status is secured in heaven. Whether you have a little or have a lot has nothing to do with your status as a human being. Listen to this. God knit you together in your mother's womb, and before the knitting began, before the moment of conception, God knew you. He knew your name. He knew the numbers of hairs on your, number of hairs on your head. He knew the color of hair that you would actually have. So how valuable are you? God accounted for your soul before you were ever conceived. You want to talk about the value of life? That's how much you matter. You don't get any more status than that. Have you ever talked to a name dropper? You know, have you ever had that conversation? Well, you know, I was in the airport in Austin, and uh, I saw Matthew McConaughey. I like that. I, I, don't, I don't think you did. <laughs> Unless you were flying private. I'm pretty sure Matt ain't on Southwest. Status is endowed by our creator, not by how much money we have. And then the fifth one is kind of the summation of all of these financial idol lies. It's satisfaction. If I could just have more, I would be satisfied. I would be satisfied. John D. Rockefeller was the wealthiest man on the planet in his day. He was the CEO of Standard Oil when oil was just getting going. A, a monopolist's monopolist. And he was asked, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money is enough? And he answered famously, just a little bit more. 
just a little, the wealthiest man in the world, it wasn't enough to satisfy, not at a soul level. But if you look at all of these lies that finances tell us, sovereignty, sufficiency, security, status, satisfaction, you see that these are all things promised us by God. It is only in God that we find true sovereignty and authority. It is only in God that we have sufficiency, that, that he is enough and therefore we are enough. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Those are your options. Love God, enslaved to money. That's it. Now, we've all heard, of course, that money is the root of all evil, right? Man, no, it's not. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money's neutral. M money, money's like a fire. Fire, <laughs> fire, <laughs> fire can, can warm you up on a cold night, or it can burn your house down. A hammer, a hammer's neutral. You can use a hammer to build a house or to injure and wound. Money's the same way, but it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. I have seen so many people, I've seen, I've seen committed Christians do things that were absolutely wrong and say, God's calling me to do this, when in reality they were doing it because they were afraid financially. They were afraid of not having a paycheck, of, of, of this or of that financially. The love of money is the root of all evil. So what do we do? Number one, choose your master deliberately and repeatedly. You have to choose. I have to choose my master. Jesus said you can't have two. You, you'll have one or the other. Choose your master deliberately and repeatedly. In Joshua 24, Joshua is addressing Israel for the final time in his life. Israel has occupied the promised land, the promised land that was guaranteed, promised to Abram and then Abraham 500 years before. They have now occupied it. They are there. They're living in the land of milk and honey. And look at what he says to them. He says, now if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods that your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. We will choose our master deliberately and repeatedly. No one has ever mastered the monster of materialism completely. It, it is... It is an ongoing battle. As long as we draw breath, we're gonna have to continue to see how much weight, how much priority are we giving to our possessions. Once you choose your master deliberately and repeatedly, number two, change your budget accordingly. Change your budget accordingly. If your checkbook or bank statement looks the same after you committed your life to Christ as it did before you committed your life to Christ, something's wrong. And, and let me just give you a, kind of a, a, a baseline to begin the conversation. If you're talking about changing your budget, start here. 10, 10, 80. 10, 10, 80. 10%. The first 10%, your first fruits offering is your tithe. You, you worship God. You, in that first fruit, you're saying, God, you're God, I'm not. I trust you for everything. 10%. Then 10% goes to savings. Pay yourself. Put money aside. This is a biblical notion. The Bible says in Proverbs, look to the ant who gathers and stores in the summer but eats in the winter. That's savings. You, you will, at some point in your life, have to replace an air conditioner in July. Save 
money for that. That's 10%. So 10 tithe, 10 savings, and then live on 80%. Also in Proverbs, it says, there are choice wines and oils in the house of the wise, but the fool spends all he has. So live on that 80%, but tithe 10%, save 10%, and live on 80. Budget according to who your master is. Budgeting means that you actually have a plan. Look at what Proverbs says. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. I still remember when my mom sat me down at our dining room table and taught me how to balance a checkbook. How many of us have ever balanced a checkbook? Let me just see your hands. How many of us have balanced a checkbook in the last two months? That's a much smaller crowd. Well, we admire you. That's great if you do it. And if you use Quicken, that doesn't count. But God says, pay attention. Know the condition of your flocks. Know how many sheeps and goats you have. Pay attention. But then look at what he says after that. Change your budget accordingly. But then, number three, check your demonstrated values against your articulated values constantly. Make sure that what your outgo is lines up with what you say you really and truly value. That same passage in Proverbs 27 concludes like this. It says, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. We know that, don't we? Riches do not endure forever. A crown is not secure for all generations. Even if you're the king, coups happen. So check your demonstrated values against your articulated values. Is what you're doing lining up with what you're saying? I'm a follower of Christ. I'm sold out. Are you? Are you really? You know, I've noticed in my own life, I'll take you out of it for a second. I've just noticed this. When, when my perspective and actions morally, sexually, and financially are surrendered and submitted to God, he's got the rest of me too. Just as a general rule, I've noticed that. That's why Jesus spoke more about our relationship to money than he did any other thing. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. This, this money idol is relentless. And so we have to be relentlesser. We, we, have, to, we have to stay on guard. Be aware of our propensity. Let me ask you this. How many of us are naturally savers. If you're just a natural saver, you just kind of have that, that genetic predisposition to frugal. That's great. That's awesome. And, and, and I know this too because I'm married to one of y'all. I know you think you're better than the rest of us. <laughs> I know that. And that's okay. How many of us are spenders? My, my hand's up in the air. I am. You're like, man, let it fly. We'll figure it out later. Here's what I've learned. Neither one's right, neither one's wrong. There are times when the Bible says to celebrate and to feast. There are also times when the Bible says to pray and to fast. It's a hard issue. You can be just as materialistic as a saver as the biggest spender among us. You can be materialistic if you are dead broke because you're always focused on how do I get it? I'm worried about it. I'm anxious about it. As you can be if you're super wealthy and sitting on a pile of it. It's a hard issue. It's a hard issue. That's why Jesus said this in his Sermon on the Mount. He said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and then he will give you everything you need. You see, when I look at 
money is my money. Mine. That's, that's the kingdom of me. But when I remember that everything entrusted to me belongs to God, that's the kingdom of him. That, that's his kingdom. That's his will be done, not my will be done. That's your will done on earth as it is in heaven. That's your will done in me as it is in heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God and live like it. And then everything else will be added to you. He, he will do it. He will provide all your needs so abundantly, so, so richly, you won't even have room enough for it. I want to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. In this moment, I, I know, I know that money is very mundane. It's an everyday thing. It's always there. And at first glance, it doesn't, doesn't feel particularly spiritual, but it is. And, and I hope that through this discussion, you see that there really is the opportunity even through something as mundane as money, there's the opportunity to connect with and engage with God at a more profound level than you ever imagined possible. That because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is the reality of an eternal significance attached even to temporal stuff. You see, Jesus changes everything. Everything. If you're here today and you've never stepped into a relationship with Christ, it's our prayer that this might be the opportunity for you to do that. That even using something as mundane as money as a springboard, you, you would have gotten a taste of the goodness of God and, and want to live in that in every way. If that's you, then we invite you to pray just silently right where you're sitting. Just talk to God in your own words silently. Pray something like this. Just say, Jesus, I need you. And so I confess my sin to you. I know you know it all anyway. I'm not telling you anything new, but I, I own it. So that I can receive your forgiveness, your amazing grace. I choose to believe that you died on the cross for me, Jesus. And I choose to believe that you rose from the dead for me. And now in exchange for your life, I give you mine. And I will follow you. Day by day, step by step. With everything that I am. Lord. I pray this prayer in your name. For just a moment, I want to ask you to remain with your heads bowed. Because we're on sacred ground when, when God moves in people's lives. And if that was your prayer, this is the biggest moment of your life. And as a church, as a family of faith with you, we want to help with the moments that follow. In just a second, we'll kind of explain how that happens around here. But right now, if that was your prayers, our heads are bowed for another moment. Would you just raise your hand? Raise your hand and hold it up high over your head. Just as a statement physically of the commitment spiritually that you just made to Christ. And no, we're excited for you. We're excited with you. 
And our family tradition around here is you put your hands down as we put our hands together just to tell you welcome home. Welcome home.